Of course, we know that the story was they were delivered through the fire. They went into the furnace. And when they came out, not even a hair on their head had been singed. And God was glorified. Paul is talking about his imminent deliverance. He doesn't know which way it's going to happen. He's convinced it's B, but he's not totally sure. Because if he was totally sure, he wouldn't say the last paragraph. Whether or not B or C happens, here's what I want you to do. Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. And he begins to talk to them about their lifestyle. He begins to admonish them about how they should live. Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man. And so we find ourselves in the, at the beginning of chapter 2. And he's continuing in this mode. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, out of all this that you are experiencing from, the, from your relationship with Christ, make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility Consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Paul says, wow, okay, I know I'm in chains. I know, I know I'm in difficult circumstances. And I know we're praying for deliverance. And whichever kind of deliverance that that Father provides for me, here's your reality. Here's your reality. You're going to have hard circumstances too. But the thing that sets us apart as believers is how we, has how we handle one another, is how we treat one another. So therefore, humble yourselves before one another. And continue to do that. Take on the very attitude that Christ had. Who being God himself, shed his godness, all but love. We know that old hymn, right? He emptied himself of all but love. And became man, dwelt among us. Because of the love that he had for us. He chose to die on a cross for our sins. Yet death did not have power over him. Where, O death, is thy victory? Where, O death, is thy sting? He rose from the dead. And God has exalted him. And at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, tongue confess that he alone, he alone is Lord. This is the passage that, that Golden Bell Camp has been surrounding themselves and, and inundating their students with. Real life, real love, real service. This is real life. Folks, it's hard. Who, who in here does not know that real life is hard? Real life is not just hard. It can be very, very difficult and very, it can be, Frustrating. Yet in the, midst of, in the midst of circumstances that I don't understand, Paul says, hey, to live is Christ. And to 
to die is gain. There is a, a resting place in his spirit and his soul and in his mind that he has found that I want. That regardless of what life deals us, to live as Christ, to die is gain. A couple of friends I want to invite up. Stephen and John. Stephen and John, these Golden Bell staffers have shared in the teaching this summer out of this passage. And uh, I just wanted you to hear a little bit from their hearts about what, what the Holy Spirit had put upon them in regards to this passage, this, this attitude that we are supposed to have, this christ likeness that we are called to. Stephen, will you just share real quick who you are and where you're from Absolutely. and where you're headed? <laughs> um, I'm Stephen Harris. I'm from Colorado Springs, Colorado, uh, born and raised. I go to Mid-American Nazarene University, which is in Olathe, Kansas, Kansas City. Um, I'm a youth and family ministry major, and this will be my senior year. John? Uh, I'm Jonathan Bean, and I go to Southern Nazarene University, which is in Oklahoma City. I actually live in Olathe. Um, and a ministry and theology major, and I'll be a senior this coming year as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Stephen, you and I were talking earlier this morning uh, about this. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, and you had something particular on your heart you wanted to share. Would you share that with us? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's wonderful reading through this passage um, and reading through any time you read through any of the letters, any of the epistles, any writings, you're like, oh, the attitude, oh, the mind. Um, those are wonderful things. We get called like, ooh, that's what I should be living. But we, we encounter some different realities when we start reading this because of our culture, because of where we are, that's similar to the realities that the people that are written to it were facing. Um, we talk about Paul's context. We also have to talk about their context, where they were these people from every walk of life, rich, poor, slaves, free, there were citizens, non-citizens, people who were being persecuted and not being allowed to buy, not being allowed to sell in the marketplace because they were saying, we live for God and not for Rome, not for these other places. We live for God. Mm -hmm. People are like, forget you. Paul then encourages them, says, okay, you know the reality that you, you've been living in. That's when our, our focus this summer is like, there's realities we encounter every day, the reality of life, the reality of difficulties, of deliverance that we need to come to, um, of life that happens. But there's realities that try to project their, their image upon us, their attitude, their mind upon us, of our culture, of our world, say, live for money, live for these things. And Paul's saying, you know that. That's what you were raised in. But you know the true reality that God calls you to live in. He created us to live in that. And so we read this in Philippians in chapter 2, where he's talking, okay, here is this reality. Here's what God calls you to, to live in, and this attitude. And a lot of times we think in our Greek or our Western thinking mind about attitude or about mind or about these thoughts, and we think, oh, it's just about my mind. It's just about what I think. It's just about what I imagine, but it's not. The, the understanding of these words, and Paul's coming from this Hebraic understanding of you are a whole person. You have a a mind, you have a heart, you have a body. And it's not just about your mind, it's about your whole self being in conjunction, being one, being the same as Jesus' attitude, the same as what we read in that, mm. that wonderful hymn in chapter two about how we're supposed to live in humbleness, about be tender, be compassionate. He goes on to talk about shining as stars, being a, an example. Yeah, And he's like, that, that's your attitude, and not just to be your whole self, just you, because we also know that these yous he's writing are collective. It's not just you individual, it's you as a whole, you as Woodland Park Church of the Nazarene. Be one together in a mindset, because otherwise you're in dissension, you're in disagreement with one another, and you're falling apart, and you're just like everyone else around you. So be one in your love for one another and being humble with one another and caring about others before yourself. And that same attitude is the same as Jesus. Mm, good. 
And that's what you're called to live in. That is your reality. And live in it. John, um, you had shared with me the, the heart of the story of, of Moses and the burning bush and, and God's deliverance there and, and his love for us. Would you just share with us briefly um, what was on your heart about that? So looking at the Philippians passage, um, kind of got from that that like our allegiance is to God and it calls us into a certain type of life. Um, and so I shared the first night about the two greatest commandments that Jesus gives in Matthew and Mark. And it's love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, like everything that you have, all that you are. Uh, and then love your neighbor as yourself. And those two go together because um, it's kind of as you uh, love God, you kind of acquire the heart of God, which is to love people. Sure. Um, and you see that kind of at work in the, in the Exodus story, Exodus chapter 3, um, God and Moses meet at the burning bush, and um, God is seen in that story. Um, you know, he says, I have seen my people in their misery, and I have heard their cries, and I know I'm aware of their suffering, so I've come down to rescue them. Um, and so I, I talked with the kids about how God is a God who rescues. God is a God who frees. Um, he sees us. He knows us. He understands that. Um, but then from that even more than that, God uses Moses in that story to carry out that same uh, action so that Moses would be a person who sees and who hears and who knows and who moves to rescue people. Um, and uh, so in that story, too, God isn't just freeing the Israelites, but he's, he's calling them into a certain type of life. Um, he's calling them to be his people, a priestly kingdom and a holy nation, um, mm -hmm. people who love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, and who love their neighbor as their self, um, people who are willing to see the suffering of other people and hear the cries of people and move to rescue them. Um, and so kind of the movement throughout the week that I went through with the kids was that, you know, first God, God sees us and hears us and knows us, um, and he seeks to rescue us, but he's also calling us to be people who are willing to see and hear and know and move to rescue um, and kind of the restoring the goodness of the creation and being people who make that a reality in our lives. Good, Good. okay. So what I'm hearing from you guys is reiterating this notion that, hey, life is hard, right? We've all agreed to that. Hard things will st are still yet to come. Until the day that that Jesus comes and rescues us from this planet and we enter into his kingdom permanently, um, life is hard. But Father hears our cries just as he heard the cries of the Israelites thousands of years ago. He still hears our cries today. And it matters to him. We, we matter to him. The stuff that's happening around us matters to him. And he has deliverance on his heart. He has deliverance on his mind. So when we pray, when we, when we engage in dialogue with Father about whatever set of circumstances we find ourselves in, we don't need to pigeonhole ourselves into if deliverance A doesn't happen, God is not in this anymore. God is in B, and God is in C. He's in A, he's in B, and he is in C. He's sovereign. He's sovereign. And he longs for our deliverance as well. So when we pray to live as Christ, to die as gain, hey, you know what, Lord, if... If the circumstances of this life actually take my life, I'm going to rejoice. If you deliver me from it, I'm going to rejoice. If you deliver me through it, I'm going to rejoice. If you deliver me because of it, I will rejoice. What an attitude. What a, what a mentality. What a resting place that is. 